So hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Book Cafe podcast. Um, in today's episode, we will be discussing this particular book right here, entitled Allah, God in the Quran by Gabriel Said Reynolds. I had the opportunity to read this book uh, during COVID times, and this was one of, uh, you know, I would say it's probably one of my best uh, reads uh, during those difficult times. And uh, I'm actually really thrilled to have the author himself with us uh, for today's episode. Uh, I'm sure that this particular discussion is going to be both enlightening and edifying. So without further ado, let me first introduce the author himself, Professor Dr. Gabriel Saeed Reynolds. Hi, Gabriel. Welcome to Book Cafe Podcast. Hello, Omar. Yeah, happy to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Great. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to us. You know, I've been a fan of your work for many years now, and uh, this really is a privilege uh, to be able to talk to you directly. So, uh, Gabriel, we'll, we'll, we'll get to talking about your book in a minute. But uh, before that, we here at Book Cafe Podcast love to know a little bit more about our authors. So do please tell us a little bit about yourself for the benefit of our viewers and listeners who may be discovering you for the very first time. You know, your educational background, your cultural background, what you do for a living, anything at all that you'd like to share with us. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Omar. Well, it's not really an exciting story, so I'll try to make it short. Uh, I'm from originally the state of Connecticut in the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, I do have some Lebanese background, so that middle name, Saeed, was my grandfather's name. In my family, uh, we were pretty assimilated to American culture. I didn't speak any Arabic at all growing up. Uh, and uh, my grandfather spoke Lebanese dialect. Um, I'm pretty sure, although... Uh, I don't know absolutely for sure, uh, but I'm pretty sure that he could neither read nor write in Arabic. He just knew the dialect and could speak. Uh, we had just vestiges of that Arabic culture that made it to uh, my generation. So food, mostly Lebanese food, a couple of uh, bad words that my mother would say when she was angry uh, with us. And uh, but that that was an important part of my um, intellectual journey because I became interested in the Middle East, just knowing there was this unique part in my background. When I went to Columbia University as an undergraduate in New York City, I started studying Arabic in the in the classroom, so studying standard Arabic. And then in the summers, I began traveling first to Jordan, uh, and then later to Syria, and then after Syria to Lebanon. Uh, and um, I remember the shock at seeing the difference between or hearing the difference between standard Arabic and the, the dialects of Jordan, Syria and Lebanon and realizing I really had to learn two languages. Uh, I went on to a graduate school uh, at Yale studying with a German professor named Gerhard Bervering. Uh, my work there was actually on a Mu'tazali, which we could speak about or just skip. Uh, but even when I was at Yale and writing this dissertation on a Mu'tazali figure, I, my interest really turned towards the Quran because of some controversies in the field around the year 2000. And uh, just to finish, finish the intellectual academic journey in 2003, I came to Notre Dame, where I teach now, and I've been there um, uh, ever since. Mm, wow. Well, it, it seems like you've had quite the journey, Gabriel. And uh, I, whenever I think of Lebanon, uh, I do think about the wonderful food that's available. I also think of uh, Khalil Gibran, the incredible poet uh, out of Lebanon. And I also think of the French language. By any chance, would you happen to be a Francophone speaker? So I can speak some French, yes, uh, from my time in Lebanon. Uh, also, I spent a year uh, in France and some time in, in Belgium. Uh, in, uh, in a couple of occasions, both in Beirut and in Belgium, I've had to teach a class in uh, French, uh, which I'm sure for the students was just a form of suffering that they had to deal with my French. But yeah, I can I can sort of manage. OK, well, uh, I wouldn't have get, uh, I, I think that you, you do speak really well because I do follow you on Twitter and I, I do see some of your tweets in the French language as well. But. Uh, but yeah, but working at a university with a French name, I'm sure it must be a little disorienting at times to keep saying Notre, Notre Dame instead of Notre Dame. So yeah, but uh, we are, after all, an English language podcast, so we're just going to let that slide. So uh, yeah, um, you know, coming back to the uh, book itself, Gabriel, uh, as I mentioned during the beginning of uh, our video that uh, I had the pleasure of reading it back during COVID times. And uh, I just went through a reread uh, before in preparation for this interview. So I think that uh, because it's entitled Allah, it's only fair that we dig deep a little bit into the etymology of the name itself. 
So uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the origins of the word Allah? Right. Yeah. Great, great question. Which actually is, is challenging to answer in a simple way. Uh, who who would think that you know one word would lead to so much uh just in in terms of its etymology or linguistic qualities would lead to so much dispute and difference in scholarly writings through through the years maybe the first point to make is that <laughs> excuse me is that arabic allah is cognate with similar words for god in other semitic languages keeping in mind that arabic is a semitic language like hebrew and aramaic and Syriac, Syriac being just a version of Aramaic with its own script. Um, and so if, just to use the example of Aramaic in Syriac there, the word for God is Allah. So very similar. Uh, Hebrew, uh, usually the plural form Elohim, but same root is used. So there's this historical etymological connection between those words for God and Allah. That doesn't fully explain things because others would like to focus on the particular context of Arabia. And they would note that in pre-Islamic pagan inscriptions, there is a pagan god who's referred to as La, sometimes El La, if that El being the definite article in Arabic. And then in a later stage of the inscriptions, where we have monotheistic inscriptions, most of which are by Christians. In Arabic, God is referred to as El Ilah. And it's possible that this form, El Ilah, which literally means the God, El Ilah, is used by these Christians writing in Arabic as a sort of equivalent to the Greek name for God, Ho Theos, which again is the God. But we also have one or two inscriptions from just before Islam. The most famous is inscription known as the Abd Shems inscription, which has been discussed online, but as far as I know, has not been uh, studied or uh, in an academic journal, which referred to God as Allah. Uh, in fact, the form in the Abd Shems uh, inscription is Allahumma, like O oh God, in this sort of vocative form. Uh, and so there, there's good reason to think that the use of Allah for God is an indigenous Arabian development and not simply a borrowing from Syriac Allaha. One, one final point is to note that in the inscriptions, El Ilah, or eventually Allah, is typical of the northern Arabian inscriptions, whereas in the south, for example, around Najran in the southern part of Saudi Arabia and in what is now Yemen, the typical name used by monotheists, Jews or Christians, for God is Rahmanan, and the an at the end is the definite article in the South Arabian languages. So basically, it's ar-Rahman. God is referred to as ar-Rahman, which is interesting. And I'll stop here. I've probably gone on too long. Oh my! No, not <laughs> it's not interesting not. because yeah. the Quran, at least in one verse, explicitly says, "Call on Him as Allah, or call on Him as ar-Rahman." And that verse seems to be a way of sort of reconciling two different ways that Arabian monotheists were referring to God in affirming that both Allah, the northern name, and Ar-Rahman, the southern name, are legitimate ways to call on God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, uh, Gabriel, is there any one particular origin theory that you lean towards? Like, uh, uh, do you feel that maybe Al-Ilah is actually what led to Allah, or do you feel that maybe it is from Allah, from the uh, Syriac or Aramaic uh, uh, bent, or from the cognate El from the Hebrew? Is there any one that you lean towards? I, I, I lean towards the indigenous explanation mm -hmm. that it comes from uh, the Arabian context, and uh, that El Ilah can easily become Allah. And we see that move, at least suggested by the Ab Shems inscri inscription, already before Islam. There, there's also a pre-Islamic inscription in the uh, the ancient South Arabian script, uh, but with which seems to be very close to Arabic, the actual language of the inscription, that refers to God apparently as Allah and as Ar-Rahman. This is an inscription studied by Ahmed the Jalad, uh, referred to as the pre-Islamic Besmala. Uh, so th that's what I lean to. But ha having said that, uh, there are great scholars like Ahmed Jalad, 
uh, Michael McDonald uh, and others who have worked on this. Also, the problem in Syriac is most people think that Allah doesn't have a doubled L. Think of Allah is written with, with two L's, two lambs in Arabic. And Allah doesn't have that doubling in Syriac, according to most scholars. But there are some who object to that. So it really becomes a very technical discussion. And I don't have really the expertise to be the final judge in the matter. Okay. All right. Okay. Fair enough. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. But I think that it's, you know, the, the only reason I um, ask is because um, I have, uh, I was always aware uh, that uh, Arabic speakers, no matter what their religious background, Jewish, Christian, or even pagan, had always had the name, uh, the word Allah to refer to uh, the, the, the Almighty, the deity. And obviously in the book, you also refer to the controversy in Malaysia where they sort of have this, uh, you know, strange occurrence where they say that uh, Allah can only be referred to the Muslim version of God and that non-Muslims won't be able to use it, etc. Which I think is quite, uh, you know, silly, if I may put it bluntly, uh, because of the fact that it's probably the non-Arabic speaking uh, Muslims who seem to be the odd one out here, that rather than using the indigenous word for God in their own language, they are importing the Arabic uh, word for God. <laughs> well, it's a it's a very interesting question. It becomes a theological question. I, mm -hmm. I noticed that in uh, uh, the American Muslim scene, there uh, is a tendency to refer to God generally as Allah in speaking in English, yeah. right? So it's it's Allah does this, Allah does that. Uh, trust in Allah. It's not trust in God. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think there's a sort of zeal there for some believers to distinguish the God of Islam. Uh, so I, I don't think it's, uh, in fact, the message of the Quran. I think uh, the Quran affirms that Jews and Christians uh, worship the same God as uh, as Muslims. In fact, um, there's, a, there's a verse in Surah Ankabut, which seems to say that, Surah 29, which, which seems to say that ex explicitly, um, uh, so uh, it's your God and our God is one. So it's pretty, it's pretty explicit. So um, I, I mean, it's not my role to, as a non-Muslim, <laughs> to interfere. Maybe I've already said too much, and I've already interfered. In which case, I apologize. But uh, I mean, uh, it seems to me that just reading the Quran and its message without making uh, points theologically about it, that it seems to affirm that um, Muslims, Christians, and Jews worship the same God, in which case um, you should feel free to use the your own language's word uh, for God. Uh, I think there's been a somewhat of a trend also in, uh, in Persian language literature and movies and music to refer to God now as Allah instead of Khoda. I think that... Um, that 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 change is taking place as well. Um, anyway, I, I shouldn't make too many observations on this, which uh, I don't know sort of the, the societal and cultural uh, questions very well. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, fair enough. In fact, uh, I'll make just one last observation and then we'll move on to the next question, which is uh, in, uh, in, in Southern Asia, I mean, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, the, the Persian influence is actually greater than the Arabic influence, because Islam actually came to this part of the world through uh, the Persians. And so we always had, uh, you know, we always gravitated towards a Persian vocabulary. Like, for example, we would say uh, sehri instead of suhur, we would say namaz instead of salat, and we would also say khoda instead of Allah. Now, uh, this was like 20, 25 years back. And now recently what I'm seeing is that people are sort of trying to move away from trying to say Khuda Hafiz and then replace it with Allah Hafiz, et cetera, et cetera. Like, but like you said, you know, that's probably more of a theological uh, debate, um, but, you know, it's interloping into the language itself, which I, uh, which I feel that is, is you know, uh, if we have that discussion, we, we can probably have that discussion another time and we can go on forever. Yes. But, uh, yeah, but, yeah. But so Gabriel, coming back to uh, the book itself, um, let me take you back to the you know seventh century Arabian. Is there something that we haven't been told by the tradition, or maybe we've discovered something new that's contrary, that's giving us a contrarian truth 
to who exactly the Meccans were uh, around that time? Yes, so uh, there's a lot to be said here. Um, I think there are different sorts of signs which point to a significant presence of not only Jews, but especially Christians in the Arabian Peninsula. So I'll just mention a couple of these without going into great detail. Um, one is the nature of the material in the Quran itself, which maybe later we could speak about more. But the Quran engages not only with biblical material, but also with Christian stories, such as the stories of the sleepers in the cave, Ashab al-Kahf, um, and the Qarnayn and others. So um, there's, and not only that, there seem to be Christian turns of phrase in the Quran. Um, things like the mustard seed or the camel in the eye of the needle are turns of phrase from the New Testament. So um, again, we could speak more about that. But th that that seems to suggest or point to a Christian culture where Christian language and stories are in the air. Uh, and, and then if we go outside of the text and look at the inscriptions, uh, it, what we find is really amazing, um, almost stunning to people who, who aren't familiar with the evidence of inscriptions, which is by the 6th century, so the 500s, there are no more pagan inscriptions in the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, as far as people can date things, I'm trusting basically Ahmad Jalad, who I see as the, the greatest authority for this. The pagan inscriptions disappear, and in, in their place are Christian inscriptions. Not a lot. I mean, a few dozen really have been found thus far. But nevertheless, we see a clear transition in the 6th century in the evidence of the inscriptions. And then um, finally, I would say that th the Quran seems to engage not only with ideas or language, but with lived Christian communities. I mean, maybe, I don't know if this is the best example, but think of Surat Al-Ma'idah, verse 83, which says of the Christians, when they hear what has brought, been brought down to the messenger, you see their eyes, uh, um, fill up with tears from what they know of the truth. So, I mean, there seems to be an actual engagement with with Christians in the place where the Quran is being proclaimed. This is a Medinan surah. There shouldn't be any Christians in Medina. So, um, now, it doesn't fully uh, explain the problem or uh, do away with the Mushrikun, because the Quran does refer regularly to Aladina Ashraku and to Mushrikun, who is usually understood to refer to pagans. Uh, and there are some references to um, possible practices uh, of, you know, uh, such as divining um, with arrows or um, uh, also pagan. Uh, pagan beliefs, most famously in sort of the Nezhim with the three goddesses. So th there, there is there there does seem to be something of paganism there. But the question is, I don't think the the, the question is fully resolved. But I think that the presence of uh, monotheists is underestimated, and the presence of pagans in the Quran's environment is overestimated. Well, the, yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting because. Uh... Uh, I, I think that this is probably, uh, you know, uh, kudos to Dr. Ahmed Al Jalad that he's that the research that he's done seems to be really helping us to reshape the landscape of uh, uh, of uh, seventh century Arabia. So I I did not know that uh, by the year 500 uh, there weren't any more pagan inscriptions left and that all of it was monotheistic. So yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. Now, uh, Gabriel, uh, let's uh, let, okay so. Uh, if I if I were to uh, you know just paint the landscape before moving on to the next question, I mean we just look at a map and we find that there are Jewish and Christian communities everywhere, right? On the Persian side, you have a couple of Zoroastrians, but by this time uh, they were mostly Christians. You have the Lachmans and the Ghassanids, you know the Melkites, uh, the the Romans uh, who were obviously Christian. The Ethiopians to the south, you've got uh, the Egypt Coptic uh, Christians. So Mecca being a pagan island, you know, that does kind of seem like a theory that seems to be, uh, you know, on its last legs. But uh, I'm sure that, you know, at some point in the future, uh, with more evidence from archaeology, uh, we'll be able to probably decisively, uh, you know, answer that question. So, yeah. And so do so thank you for that. Um, so uh, moving on to the next question, Gabriel, I, I want to say that I really enjoyed the way 
in the book how you juxtaposed the Quranic uh, version of God with the biblical version, because this is something that we don't really see a whole lot, at least not uh, not in a lot of the books that I've come across, where uh, where the portrayal of God in the Hebrew Bible, the Greek New Testament, and the Quran is pretty much put side by side and you know contrasted. That's that pr probably is something that I really enjoyed about the book. If you were to co make a comparison between the portrayal of God in the Hebrew Bible, the Greek New Testament, and the Quran. Um, how far off are they from each other or how similar are they to each other? Yeah, great, great question. It's a difficult question in part because the Bible, of course, is a library of works. For Jewish believers, what makes the Hebrew Bible coherent is the way that the community has passed down a certain way of reading all these books together. For Christian believers, it's very similar. It's the way the church has brought all of these books together. And um, in the light of the tradition, as Christians see it, passed on from the apostles, learned to read these books together. But from a literary historical book, uh, perspective, we have many dozens of different books. Uh, the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, as you know, written in Hebrew, the uh, New Testament, as you know, written in Greek. So it's difficult to say, is there just one particular biblical vision of God? Um, part of the beauty of the Bible, um, I think, is that you have different perspectives. And so you can learn more by reading different books. Whereas the Quran, I mean, some people might dispute this, but most people would say it's a single, singly authored book, all written in Arabic at roughly the same amount of t uh, or period of time. Um, so, um, the the in Allah, uh, God in the Quran, my principal argument is to uh, bring the two the two portrayals of God together. And so, there are different moments in the book where I'll say like, "Oh, here the Quran says." that um, God is uh, God can take out vengeance or God can lead astray. And then I'll say, uh, but before you get too um, critical of the Quranic vision of God, look at this passage in the Bible where God is doing something similar. So, um, and likewise with, with mercy. Um, I mean, I, I think that there are a couple of important contrasts. Uh, the author of the Quran clearly did not like the idea of of certain portrayals of God, for example, God as Father. I mean, that's just an, an that's just noticeable. It's it's very prominent in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a way both Jews and Christians refer to God. And the Quran Quranic author, of course, for Muslims is God. Did not like this idea of God as Father. In a related point, did not like the idea of humans as being created in the image of God. Although I think the the bit in Surah Al Baqarah where humans are referred to as a Khalifa is actually close to that idea. So I would say the Quran puts a certain accent on the transcendence of God, even compared to the Old Testament, and definitely compared to the New Testament, which of course has the idea of the incarnation. So the transcendence of God is distinct. Uh, still, part of the argument of the book is that um, as I read the Quran, the image of God still has a lot of personality in the Quran. Um, so this is not, as I put it in the book, this is not the God of the philosophers who is not engaging or responding to human action, but this is a personal God who engages with human action, responds to it, grows angry, is pleased, etc. So, uh, I mean, th those would be a, a couple of the, the the points of contrast, but the real emphasis on the book are points of agreement. Okay, so more emphasis on the books on the points of agreement. Okay, so, okay, fair enough. So Gabriel, coming to the next question, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, at the time that uh, the Quran had made its appearance, uh, a lot of scholars are in agreement that there was no Arabic version of the Bible available, right? So from a his critical historical perspective, let's exclude the divine, from a critical historical perspective, where exactly do you feel that the stories that we find in the Quran, where, where could they have originated from if there wasn't an Arab, Arabic Bible at the time to kind of, you know, as a source material? Yes, I, that's a great question. Thank you, Omar. I, I think that the key to answering that question is looking at the nature of the Jewish and Christian stories with which the Quran is engaging. Uh even the nature of the material from the Bible that is engaged with in the Quran. So um, it's just noticeable, for example, that we have many of the stories of Genesis, especially Adam, Noah, Abraham, and then, of course, Joseph, 
engaged with the Quran and Moses. M most of the prophets from the Bible, so the, uh, for example, the four major prophets in the Bible, um, including Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel, um, are not referred to, were not referred to by name. Um, and in the mind, the so-called minor prophets of the Bible, the one one prophet engaged with is the only minor prophet whose uh, book is a story and not a list of proclamations, and that's Jonah. So, and that's that's the minor prophet in whom the Quran is interested. In other words, uh, the Quran seems to be uh, connected with stories that would be uh, important part of. Uh, Jewish or Christian culture that would have been um, told in a popular setting, potentially that would have been the source of homilies in a Christian context more frequently. Um, and, and it's no surprise then that we find stories outside of the canon of the Bible, as mentioned earlier, like the Companions of the Cave or the, the story of Dhul-Qarnayn, um, also finding their way, or at least the Quran engages with them. I think we're, we're speaking about principally an oral transmission. One last thing, and then uh, I'll, I'll stop talking about all this. The study of Syriac homilies and the Quran is a really rich field of inquiry. This does not mean the Quran was written in Syriac, or that I'm arguing that the Quran is a Syriac homily, uh, not at all. Um, but in helping us understand the religious context, of uh, of the Quran, uh, when we look at especially someone named Jack of Sarug, who dies in 521, I could speak more about him, um, but many of his homilies are sorts of commentaries on scripture from a Christian point of view, and um, the connection between those homilies and the Quran is very interesting. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, okay, all right. So, yeah, um, you know, the... The sleepers of Ephesus and Zulkarnain both appear, you know, right next to each other in that one particular surah. So uh, just for my knowledge and maybe for anybody else who may not know the answer, where where did the story of the sleepers of Ephesus come from? Uh, I mean, it's not in the in the canon of the Bible, but is there any one particular book where it's a uh, non-canonical book where it's available or is it just oral traditions that were up in the air? Yeah, this one we know we know of uh, from a written a documentary source. Boy, we could have a whole uh, session uh, just on this the sleepers of the Ephesus and the Quran's interest in this story. So, as as you note, in the Christian context in the Middle East, probably beginning in the fifth century, but I believe our earliest version of it comes from the sixth century and is from the scholar I just mentioned, the Syriac scholar Jacob of Sarug, uh, who wrote a homily on a story which is known as the, the sleepers, the seven sleepers or the seven sleepers of Ephesus or the sleepers of Ephesus. It was a very popular story that has a rich manuscript tradition um, in Syriac and had all sorts of echoes in the Christian world, as it did eventually in the Islamic world as well. The principal point of the story, although you don't really ask this, but I, I'm tempted to say one or two things. The principal point of the story is that not only the soul is eternal, but also the body will be resurrected or raised. And this was a debate that had gone on, as it would go on also in certain Islamic circles, uh, that had gone on in certain cer Christian circles in late antiquity. There are certain um, groups of Christians associated with the early church father origin, who apparently, at least according to their enemies, denied the resurrection of the body. And the story is meant to respond to them. Um, I could say more about the Christian story, but yeah, it, its most popular form is from uh, Jacob of Sarug. One really interesting thing about the story is that we have different variations of how many sleepers, how many companions, ashab, there were in the Christian context. Some say seven, some say eight, even though the famous one is seven. Uh, and then we see the Quran is actually concerned not only with the story, but with debates about the story, because at the end of the passage on the, the sleepers, it, it says, oh, don't argue. Some say this, some say that. Don't argue about how many companions there were. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and uh, and you said that quite succinctly. Yeah, the, the, the Quran um, does say, you know, don't argue about the number of sleepers that there were. And uh, just just once again, for my knowledge, Gabriel, uh, can you tell us if was was the dog mentioned as well in that original story of John's? 
in the episode. So the great. So the dog is not mentioned in Jacob's uh, version of the sleeper's account. He speaks of a watcher. Uh, and it, the Syriac word will come to me before the end of our session, probably, hopefully. Uh, but he speaks of a watcher, um, which seems to be an allusion to an angel. But keep this in mind. <laughs> the uh, language that Jacob use, uses to speak about the sleepers and their enemy is all wrapped up in uh, metaphorical language around shepherding and guarding sheep. So the young the young men, the sleepers, are referred to as sheep. Christ is referred to as the good shepherd. And the enemy, who is the pagan king, is referred to as a wolf. And then, then we find the word watcher. And so it seems like an obvious next step to interpret the watcher who's guarding the sheep from the wolf as a dog. Wow. Well, uh, thank you for that. And uh, I'll digress a little bit and I'll ask, I'll tell you why I asked about the dog. Um, the reason being that, uh, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of Muslim communities and Bangladesh is no exception. Uh, we there is this notion that dogs are basically unholy. And so you shouldn't have dogs in the house or you know, as pets, etc. So the the sleepers of the cave and the dog is always my go to story whenever I want to give a counter argument to people. Because I'm a part, my wife and I were part of a lot of animal welfare, welfare associations. So we try our best to try and change the perception, the negative perception about dogs, and say to people that you know what, if God Almighty Himself, um, you know, as per what you believe, uh, you know, felt that the dogs were unholy, He probably wouldn't have tried mentioning it in the first place in the Quran. Because if this wasn't in the original story of the sleepers of Ephesus, you know, why have it in the Quran in the first place? It doesn't. Uh, serve any purpose except to say that you know there is something very positive about the dog but yeah um you know i just thought i just wanted to share that so um yes you know, so uh, so yeah so gabriel moving on um you know the next question that i have for you is is actually uh, not a question of my own but it comes from somebody else a very prominent islamic scholar uh, based in toronto ontario canada and his name is Dr. Shabir Ali. Um, he is the president of the uh, Islamic Information Dawa Center in Toronto, Canada. And uh, when he heard that I was uh, going to interview you for, you know, for today's uh, episode, uh, he did have a question that he hoped that I would be able to tell you. And he is, by the way, a big fan of your work. So I'm just going to read out the question that he told me, that he gave me. Uh, Dr. Shabir Ali asks, uh, ask Dr. Reynolds for more clarity on what he thinks to be the Quranic view towards the Bible? Does the Quran endorse the Bible as it was in the time of the prophet? Or does the Quran regard the Bible as something that needs corrected? And he also says to make reference to your article in the book, The Quran's Reformation of Judaism and Christianity by Dr. Holger Zalantin. So in other words, I believe that doc what Dr. Shabir Ali is asking is whether the Quran is going with the misinterpretation of scripture or the physical distortion of scripture, uh, you know, by the Judeo-Christian communities. So yeah, it's a uh, so a, a question which I hope that you can help to shed some light on. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I have seen Dr. Ali in different uh, uh, different talks, and extremely intelligent. So I'm grateful for the question. Uh, I mean, I would say, in a word, um, I think the Quran uh, itself, although. Keeping in mind, Islamic theology is not only about the Quran, it's more complicated than that, but the Quran itself does not affirm the physical distortion or corruption of Scripture. Uh, I'll say a couple of things about this. First, the famous word tahrif, generally rendered corruption or falsification. Um, it appears, as far as I know, only in the verbal form in the Quran, in the phrase, yuharifuna kalima an muwadiyahi. Um, so in a couple of different places. Uh, and I, I think a careful examination of that phrase, يحرفون الكلمة عن uh, The موادير is important because that means subjects or topics. So it, it, they, the accusation is they do تحريف of الكلمة, of the words, from their topics. Uh Potentially, Moadir could mean places. That makes it a little more complicated. But I understand it to mean topics. Uh, and so um, I, 
I don't see that as an accusation of, of physical uh, distortion. I think other uh, vocabulary in the Quran that um, is often cited to affirm physical distortion or corruption um, is uh, is actually ambiguous. So when the Quran says uses, for example, bedala or speaks of hi hiding or tw twisting tongues, um, some of the ones that come initially to mind, or uh, I might have gotten a word or two wrong there. Something like that verse. Uh, so woe to those who write with their hand the book with their hands and then say this is from God. Uh, so um, all of those things together, I think, bespeak or reflect an accusation that um, Jews and Christians, but careful examination shows it's usually Jews, are poor stewards or caretakers of revelation. Finally, I would note that uh, the Quran, in more than one place, but maybe the easiest place to point to is in sort of Yunus, uh, seems to affirm that the book that the Christians and Jews are reading is a source of reference. When it says, فَإِن كُنْتَ فِي شَكِّ مِمَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ فَاسْأَلُونَ الَّذِينَ Something like that. Again, I might have missed a word there. I apologize if I did. But it's the basic message of this verse in Surah Yuna, Surah 10, is if you are doubt about what we reveal to you, then ask those who were reading the book before you. Uh, so um, uh, the reference to the, the book being being read already in the Jews and Christians as a source of reference seems to suggest a possibility that the book is still valid. Um, uh, the reference to the Christians as Ahlul Injil in Surah Al-Ma'idah also seems to confirm that maybe the Injil is still valid. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm saying the Quran is supporting Christian and Jewish uh, doctrine or teaching. I think the Quran is is has very clear polemics against Christian especially, but also Jewish teaching. Um, but that, that's my reading of the Quran. Uh, again, it's not my business to decide things. And just it's an important thing to keep in mind that Islamic theology, like Jewish and Christian theology, is not only about the scripture. Islamic theology develops through natural theology for rational reflection on the truths that are around us in nature and in the human person, through the hadith, through the community and other factors. Hmm. Okay, so interesting. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, that says, um, you know, it's pretty well said, because uh, uh, in a lot of the verses itself, it says that, you know, go back, you know, you have nothing to stand by if you don't stand by the Torah and the gospel. So obviously, uh, the Quran is obviously endorsing the scripture as it was at the time. So yeah, I, I think that that really puts bed to bed that uh, particular argument. So uh, Gabriel, you know, coming back to... Um, the you know the entire raise and death of the book if i may say so uh, you you have the the theological tension that you talk about in the book that allah is a god of both mercy and vengeance you've alluded to the fact that uh, a lot of it can be based on the, this portrayal of god in the quran being a god of both uh, mercy and vengeance uh, can be attributed to the names of god as well as the actions of god so if I were to ask you that, to what extent have you based this perception on the names as, and, and to what extent is it based on the actions of God? Uh, what would be your answer to that particular question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, first, just in terms of the tension uh, in the portrayal of God, um, th this is sort of the heart of the book that I wrote. Uh, I think it's intentional. Um, there are different scholars, uh, maybe most famously Daud Rahbar, but also Fazlur Rahman. These are scholars writing in English um, uh, who have tried to un undo that tension. Um, uh, but I think it's sort of woven into the tapestry of the Quranic message. Uh, I think that that tension is part of an intentional, thoughtful way of motivating the audience towards the disposition of fear of God, fear and love of God. Um, so, I mean, you have many, obviously, messages about God's mercy, 
not only mercy, but um, kindness, for forgiving nature, toward, to web, the one who turns towards humans. But then you have many messages in the Quran about God as dhu uh, intiqam or muntaqim, vengeful, sari al hisab, quick to judge, uh, references to God leading people astray. Um, for for me, uh, the, at least in the book, I, I focus more on the descriptions of God's actions. Um, I think it's very interesting that God has said um, not only to uh, to guide and lead astray, but God is capable of doing, for example, tezyin, which is something like adornment to, of making evil actions seem good to the unbelievers. Um, uh, and even in the language used for God on the day of resurrection, um, towards those who have been condemned, tell us that uh, there there is this vengeful aspect with God. Um, and then at the same time, uh, we have uh, descriptions of God sending prophets, planting signs in nature, in the natural world, in the rain, in the food, in the human faculties of sight, hearing, and thinking, which all can lead us back to God and therefore to salvation. So it's just very rich descriptions of God, both on the vengeful side and on the merciful side. And I think all of that is a thoughtful way of motivating the audience towards fear and love of God. Um, so, I mean, that's basically my answer. All right. Okay. So, Gabriel, um, I want to go back to uh, the uh, the discussion with regards to the sleepers of Ephesus and Zulkarnain. So, we did talk about the sleepers of Ephesus, but we have to touch a little bit upon Zulkarnain. Um, there are a lot of theories going around uh, with regards to who the historical, who was the real Zulkarnain. Uh, I remember that Abdullah Yusuf Ali, in his translation of the Quran, uh, he had a huge commentary that he feels that it may have been Alexander the Great. The great uh, Muslim, uh, Indian Muslim scholar Abul Kalam Azad feels that it might have been Cyrus the Great. And then there was one other prominent uh, Islamic cleric named Dr. Yasser Qadi who feels that it may have been Darius the Great. So a lot of great, great, great people. Um, is there any one particular um, theory that you lean towards? I personally seem to go with Cyrus the Great, because he was a figure that was known to the Jews of Medina, and uh, he obviously has a very prominent place in the Hebrew Bible. But what is your opinion on who could have been the historical Zulkarnay? Yes, so my opinion is certainly that it's Alexander. And uh, there, I know there's some controversy in certain circles, because the historical Alexander was almost certainly a polytheist and a pagan, whereas Dunkarnain is presented in the Quran as uh, a monotheist um, and a servant of God. So, um, but it's what happens in between that matters, because in late antiquity, in the Christian period, uh, to use maybe sort of funny language, Alexander is baptized by Christians. And even though he lived before Christ, he's understood to have anticipated the coming of Christ and Christian teaching. And so he becomes, in especially in Syriac writings, uh, a holy figure. And in uh, uh, in texts such as the Alexander legend, um, uh, a Syriac text known as the Nashana, he travels to the end of the world. He travels to the north where Gog and Magog are. Uh, and so it's it's very close to what we find about the Qarnayn in the Quran. Um, yeah, so I think it's pre pretty clear from, from my point of view. Uh, I've been wrong many times before, so who knows? Uh, but the really, there's been really good studies by Kevin Van Bladel uh, of Yale University and Tomaso Teze on the relationship between the Syriac Alexander and the Quran in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, yeah, perhaps there is something about Alexander's history that maybe we don't know about. Perhaps he was a monotheist, but... I, I did see that interview of yours with uh, Alex, uh, Tommaso Tomai, so uh, that really piqued my interest. So, uh, you know, Gabriel, we're pretty much coming towards the end of our discussion, but I cannot let you go without first talking a little bit about Jesus, given the season that we are in. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Jesus in the Quran and the Bible. Um, we'll skip through the etymology because uh, I think that, uh, you know, we could go on forever with why he's referred to as Isa in the Quran, whereas Arab Christians refer to him as Yasu. Um, in, the, in, in the Greek New Testament, it's uh, Yeshua, uh, etc. But let's come to the, the, the stories about Jesus himself. 
Uh, with regards to the crucifixion um, of Jesus in the Quran, the Quran seems very uh, deliberately ambiguous, if that's a nice way of putting it, about what exactly happened to Jesus during his last hours on earth. So do you feel that uh, when it says, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him? Uh, my, my first question as a non-Arab speaker is, uh, should it not be the other way around, that they didn't crucify him, nor did they kill him? So why is it back to front, if I may ask? Why is it that way? Yeah. That's a great, yeah, great question. Uh, as you may know, some Arab grammarians speak about something as known as taqdim wa ta'khir, which means the Quran sometimes might put things out of order for rhetorical purposes. So that's one possible explanation. Another more historical explanation is that uh, crucifixion was not only used by the Romans as a method of execution, but also as a method of uh, public dis display and humiliation um, of accused criminals. Uh, and in fact, in early Islam, uh, this practice continued. Um, there's a great book by someone named Sean Anthony on crucifixion. I think it goes on to say, as death and spectacle. And it's spectacle because even in early Islam, but also in the early Roman period, um, figures would sometimes be killed in one way, but then their bodies would be hung up. This is gruesome talk. <laughs> their bodies would be hung up for display, both as a humiliation, um, uh, but also uh, as a for further punishment, because you're depriving them of burial, which was important, yeah. and as a method of warning. Um, so that's a historical explanation that some people say, that's why it's the killing comes first and the crucifixion comes next. Okay, so in other words, is be, uh, so crucifixion wasn't actually a way to put people to death. It was kind of like a torture and uh, as a deterrent, uh, you know, to, to deter people from. You know. Yeah, but not a, not a torture, according to this explanation, this historical explanation. It was for spectacle. It was just a okay. way. I mean, I mean, these these are horrible things to talk, to talk about. But you know how um, people might uh, behead someone and then put the after they've beheaded them, put their head on a yeah. stake yeah. as yeah. as a warning and a humiliation. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Well, I think that that really uh, explains it very well. Because, uh, uh, and that was always something on my mind, which I really am glad that you answered that really well. So, uh, Gabriel, we're almost towards the end of our hour here. But because we are, after all, a podcast about books, I do have to ask you uh, one last thing with regards to books. Um, if you could, uh, you know, pick a book that you feel that every, you know, that's a young person should read at least once in their lifetime, what book would you uh, recommend? That's a tough one. <laughs> that's, that's the toughest question so far. Well, uh, I mean, if I had to choose, uh, but maybe it's because I've read it recently, it would be The Good Earth by the American author Pearl Buck. Um, who grew up in China, and it's a story of a of a man, uh, a poor man in China. Very very beautiful story, without uh, giving the story away and uh, spoiling it. Uh, I mean, it has some sadness in the story, um, but very touching. I mean, the sort of book that I think le leaves leaves you thinking afterwards, which I think is a quality of good literature. Can I mention another book? A couple more? Yeah, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. But very briefly, um, so not so much for young people, definitely for adult readership. Um, but, you know, a book that really touched me, uh, two books that really touched me that I, I wrote about, you, people can find it somewhere online on some Notre Dame website if they're interested. Uh, one was For Whom the Bell Tolls of Ernest Hemingway uh, about the Spanish Civil War. And then um, there's an Arabic book translated uh, into English as Baghdad Eucharist. In the Arabic version, if your viewers would like to can find it and would like to read in Arabic, it, the title is Ya Maryam. And the author is Sinan Antun, an Iraqi. Um, so another beautiful, beautiful book. Two beautiful stories about war. They're both about war. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've written some something somewhere. I don't know where the website is. But if you're ambitious and you want to start Googling, you can find my reflection on the connection between those two books. Wow. Well, that, that, that sounds great. So I'm, I'm definitely going to put that on my reading list. And uh, I do hope that whoever is watching and listening to this podcast does the same. So, yeah, thank you so much for that. Now, uh, you know, uh, do you happen to have a favorite uh, book from the Bible that you enjoy reading or 
uh, that you find a lot of solace in, for example? Any any one particular book from the Bible that you particularly like? Oh, that's that's another difficult one. Uh, I would say from the the Old Testament, uh, the Psalms are very beautiful. Yeah, so I would encourage you know even if you're not a Christian or a Jew, uh, reading the Psalms even as devotional literature can be very beautiful. Um, and from the New Testament, I mean, of, of the Gospels, uh, you know, just in terms of reading enjoyment, probably Luke's Gospel, I find the most interesting, has the nativity story, uh, mm -hmm. has a number of parables we find only in Luke. And then it's continued by the Acts of the Apostles is sometimes spoken of as uh, the Gospel of the Church or the fifth, the fifth Gospel, because it tells the story of the early church. So interesting reading. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. So, Gabriel, we, we are uh, right at the cusp of uh, ending this episode. But before we really let you go, um, do please tell us if there's any new writing project that you're working on. Is there any book that's coming out that your fans and readers can expect to see very soon? Thank you. So uh, it won't be very soon, but I, I am in about halfway through a book on Christianity in the Quran that deals with some of the historical issues uh, in regard to pre-Islamic Arabia and the presence of Christians there. Um, but also, without giving too much away, um, thinks with the Quran about its engagement with Christian theology, not only in the passages that explicitly address Christianity, but also in the formulation of its own theology. Um, things in life are very often in relationship. So, um, you know, the way I speak in this interview is the response to your questions and uh, and the way you've worded things. So I ask a question. You know, how does Christianity affect or um, how does the Quran thoughtfully engage with Christianity in the way it articulates its own distinct theology? So uh, that's about halfway through. So it'll be a while before it comes out, probably titled Christianity and the Quran. OK, so um, so so Gabriel, um, uh, you know, you started a YouTube channel last year. And I have to say that uh, it's probably one of the best channels that I've come across because you not only are you a scholar yourself, but you're also interviewing other scholars as well. Would you like to tell our viewers and listeners who probably aren't familiar with the channel what it's about? And would you like to put in a plug for that so that we can get some more viewers? Thank you. That's very, that's very gracious of you. Thank you. Yes, the channel is called Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I would say about 90% of the interviews thus far are with Quran scholars, but a diverse range of Quran scholars um, that you know cover things from the Quran as literature, to ancient inscriptions, to the, the manuscript evidence for the Quran. So lots of interesting stuff there. I'm trying to get some more Bible stuff up there. There's been a couple. And one I've just recorded, not yet released, on uh, the theory of Q, the document that supposedly lies behind the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. I, I work on the Quran, as you know, personally, so it's just natural. I have more Quran folks. But uh, yeah, so um, it's been really fun. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad to be on your channel as well. Um, and uh, look forward to great things from it. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, well, I, I like you said, I highly recommend the channel because I've, I've had so much fun watching it over the last couple of years. So yeah, I kudos to you for starting it in the first place. And I do hope that it continues to go strongly. Now, just one last question. Um, you are, of course, the founding member of ICSA, the International Quranic Studies Association. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about what ICSA is about and uh, who are some of the other founders that that you co-founded with, et cetera? And sure, yeah. It, it, the International Quranic Studies Association is the first, uh, the study of the Quran. Uh, it um, publishes uh, books, has a journal, the Journal of the International Quranic Studies Association, or JIXA, uh, and has meetings and resources online on its website, um, membership is really inexpensive and it's an international community, diverse international community. Everyone who's interested in serious scholarship on the Quran is uh, most welcome. I uh, don't have to be a professor. A anyone is welcome to be part of the community. It's a very friendly community. Uh, I worked on it in the beginning together with Amran al-Badawi, who is a professor at the University of Houston. The current executive director is Haytham Sidki, who people might know is a scholar of Quranic manuscripts. Um, and yeah, a ter terrific community. Our most recent meeting was in Italy, but we've met also in Indonesia and Morocco and Tunisia and in different places in the United States. Okay, excellent. 
So yeah, it definitely uh, seems like something that everybody should be checking out. So yeah. So uh, Gabriel, we are probably gone over time. So I do want to be respectful of your, your busy schedule. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today on Book Cafe Podcast. Uh, and to our viewers and listeners, the book, once again, is Allah, God in the Quran. I highly recommend it. Go out and buy it. I, in fact, have two versions of it. One is the ebook, and I loved it so much that I had my brother send this to me all the way from California. So, yeah, um, you know, just go ahead and read this. It's a really fantastic book written by a fantastic scholar. So, Professor Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds, thank you once again for being with us. I hope to have a, ch a chance to talk to you again soon. And uh, I wish you and your family all the very best. Merry Christmas and a uh, very happy new year. Thank you so much, Omar. The pleasure has been mine and, and very best wishes to you and yours as well.